Medical device R&D can be an inspiring but intimidating feat. And it's more than the pacemakers and insulin pumps and nanotechnology and robotics. Medical device R&D also includes tape and tongue depressors and scissors and bandages. I consider myself a medical device archaeologist. I hunt out the technologies, take them apart, I understand exactly what components are inside and how they work and explore what their future holds. One of the first expeditions that I went on was to a Nicaraguan hospital. It was there that the director was showing us the brand new donated ventilator that they were so proud to have inside their hospital. But what actually caught my attention was the nurse working quietly in the background. Soila, here, was placing hand-cut cloth glasses on tiny infant babies who are undergoing phototherapy treatment for jaundice. It was amazing. They were handmade every day by her and her team, custom for each baby. And to me, it was incredible that something so simple, so elegant, could so dramatically improve the quality of care for these tiny patients. So when I think about medical device R&D, I see an entire underground growing movement of stealth innovators. They modify, they adapt, they create, they experiment, and they save patients' lives every day with the material that they have on hand. And a lot of these, a lot of these stealth innovators are nurses. They're hacking into the hospital supply closet. And what I mean by hacking into the hospital supply closet is they take materials that they can find and they modify them for the patients who they're caring for. The Little Devices Lab at MIT, where I'm a co-investigator, wants to recognize these nurses. So three years ago, we started a program called Maker Nurse. And Maker Nurse set out to find nurses around the world who are creating solutions that are improving care for their patients. They weren't tell anybody, telling anybody about it, but it was obvious to us in the hospitals that we'd visited that they were having a tremendous impact in the quality of care, the cost of care, and overall patient outcomes. So let me tell you about Roxana. Roxana is a wound care nurse in Texas. She was one of the first maker nurses who we met when we started the maker nurse program. So you have hospitals all around the world who invest a ton of funding into IT systems and technology trying to reduce costs. Well, Roxana saved her hospital a quarter of a million US dollars every year just by changing the way that they treated abdominal wall defects in infants. So she was using bandages and scissors and her nursing know-how to transform how these babies were cared for. And then instead of going home in four months, Roxana's patients were able to go home in two with no risk for complications. So that inspired us. It was incredible. We were excited to hear, excited to see that it wasn't just resource poor settings like Nicaragua where this is happening. This is all over the world. And so with Maker Nurse, there were four different areas that we were researching. What materials are they using? Who are they sharing their ideas with? Are they getting recognized by their patients? by their supervisors, by their peers? And where are they? Are there hot spots of where this is happening? Is it happening more in rural zones or urban zones? Um, that, that, was where, that was what we started with. So then 60,000 miles later and countless hours inside of the hospitals, these are some of the nurses who we met. So this was in Medellin, Colombia. And this nurse created this simple device using tape and foam to stabilize tracheas. And they actually had a commercially available solution in the hospital. She was holding it on the right-hand side. But to her and her team, this was, it was 10 times more expensive and it wasn't as comfortable for the patients. The patients actually preferred the ones that they were making at the hospital instead. So when you see this, sorry, I just gave it away, but um, you may, you know, to the normal eye, it may look like ventilators, monitors, and tubing. 
But to our team, we saw the markings of a maker nurse. You can see a small string that's holding, if you look quickly, you can see it. <laughs> a small string that's holding the tubing in place. And so what this does is it makes the patient a lot more comfortable because it removes the weight from the tubing so it's no longer pulling down. Very simple fixes, but these things dramatically improve patient's experience inside of hospitals. Tape and towels at the bottom of this screen are stabilizing this medication for this tiny patient. Victor Tai is an oncology nurse in New York. Victor created this Lego model for nonverbal patients in order to communicate with them what their treatment was going to be. So he would be able to show them, this is where you will sit, this is the machine, this is what your treatment will be like when you go in. And to be able to communicate that to patients who are undergoing a very intensive treatment was so valuable. It turns out Victor's wife is also a nurse, so this model moves throughout different hospitals in New York and is able to help many different patients. The thing that's exciting to us is this is Lego. So anybody in the world can look at how Victor made this and recreate it. Nicole is a nurse from Galveston, Texas, and she works in the catheter lab. Nicole created this device to stabilize patients' arms when they go into procedures. She used materials from a local hardware store, an old computer stand that was left over in the hallway, and she borrowed her colleague's hacksaw, broke it three times, and then finally was able to, to finish her device that she now uses with her team in the hospital. So instead of a stack of towels to hold the patient's arms, they're actually able to position them appropriately. And Nicole Glover is another nurse from Texas. She works in the correctional facility. Nicole wanted to have her hands free when she was opening every single door to get to her patients, but she also just wanted to make one trip back there so she didn't have to keep going to get the medicine. So she essentially made a tool belt, but for medication. So after six years of working with all of these nurses and supporting what they're doing and, and learning from them, we're making the tent bigger. We're making it more intentional, actually inviting physicians, respiratory therapists, physical therapists, patients, and caregivers into the maker movement to join and, and to collaborate with their nurse colleagues in creating these devices to improve healthcare. So we have a network of medical maker spaces in hospitals globally, starting with in Texas and in Virginia and New York and Massachusetts, we're bringing the tools of prototyping right to the bedside. Because as you saw, the staff across hospitals are making incredible solutions with the materials that they have on hand. So can you imagine what they would come up with if you actually brought some of the tools from a makerspace and mix mixed them with a hospital supply closet? So we've been working with burn unit nurse staff, pediatric nurse staff, rehabilitation teams of occupational therapists and physical therapists to actually prototype right at the point of care. And it's amazing because when doctors and nurses and patients have great ideas to work with, we're able to send them right up the elevator to the next floor and they have access to everything from 3D printers and laser cutters but really basic hand tools are what get used the most. Dremels, screwdrivers, you name it, they have access to it there to work on. So in the near future, what's exciting to us is thinking about a doctor won't just be prescribing a pill bottle and your medication, but a prototype so that you can make your own pill bottle more ergonomic. Or maybe you add sensors and reminder systems to it because you want to know when your grandmother is taking your medication. And then imagine if instead of going to a pharmacy to pick up whatever devices you need, you go with your occupational therapist right to the craft store so you can create that custom arm brace with the materials that you want. And inside of these maker spaces, we're making sure that the ideas don't just stay on the unit or they don't just stay with that one hospital because there's patterns of, of how problems are solved that are the same across the world. 
So we've installed selfie stations inside of the maker spaces to help with documentation so that projects can go as quickly as possible from the maker space to impacting patients in every, every place around the world. In the near future, we just won't have patients showing up at clinics with their Google search results or glucometer data, but instead with prototypes, with 3D printed clips that they made to manage their catheter tubing. It was maybe downloaded from a website in a file that was created by a nurse and caregiver duo in Montana. So this is the future of medical device R&D. And this is our way of responding to a healthcare system that for far too long has pushed the limitations of black box medical device design. And it's not just about inventing it at MIT. This is about inventing it everywhere, about making health everywhere. It's what we call maker health. And this is definitely going to require a shift in thinking. It sounds really crazy to think that you can make your own medical device and you can use it on your treatment. But actually, it's not that crazy. We've been here before. In 1976, Andreas Grunzig in Switzerland prototyped the first balloon angioplasty catheter right on his kitchen counter. In the at-home pregnancy test, that was actually designed by a graphics designer using paperclip boxes in her office desk. In the beginning of the 19th century, nurses had their own trade publication to share examples of what they're making. There were blueprints for how to make a baby apron to carry babies out of the hospital in case of an emergency. Color coding systems for IVs so you could tell the 18 different tubes apart when patients were getting treatment. And we recognize that this requires a system change as well. We need to think differently about how we design hospitals and clinics for patients in order for this to work. But that's actually how our healthcare system has evolved around the world. It wasn't until 1926 that Walter Dandy introduced intensive care units into hospitals. And it wasn't until the 1990s that simulation labs brought models and new ways of training our healthcare professionals. or the medical maker spaces of 2015 that we've launched this year. Because we don't just want you guys to talk about new ideas in healthcare, or brainstorm them, or whiteboard them. We want you to make them. We want you to make them real, to hold them in your hands, and use them to heal people. Thank you. <laughs>